Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time we can preview another quarter, especially as we deal with the minor prophets. Those were special messengers you sent in the Old Testament to awaken your people and make known to them what kind of a God you are. And yet in those messages was looking forward towards the coming restoration and redemption in Jesus Christ. Teach us as we open these lessons to understand better the character that you have and how it has been expressed in the ultimate revelation in our Lord as our Savior and our Redeemer. Be with us, open our minds in our study, and give us responsive hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so there should be several handouts that I gave to you. One handout is now being shown here. Okay, this is a two-page handout, which is, a, which is something to do with uh, the kings. Benji, can you give me one set? Because uh, Tim's taking the... Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the study for the entire quarter has something to do with prophets, okay? And uh, how do we understand a prophet? Prophet is literally translated as a mouthpiece, a mouthpiece of God, a spokesman for God. Uh, when we talk about the Old Testament, it is very commonly referred to as the law, the prophets, and the writings, right? You've heard about that. What's the law? The law is the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, that's why it's Penta. That's the, the, that's the, that's the horn in the parking lot. <laughs> but the law is, the law is the first five books written by Moses. And then when we talk about the writings, yeah, I brought up my Bible with me. If you look at a Bible, typically, uh, especially with the newer ones, you will see that this is a lot of uh, heavy text in the paragraphs, okay? Now, if I open it up towards the middle, which is now the Psalms, you see the difference? The difference is these are written in stanzas, in verses. The closest analogy I shared with the Sabbath, Sabbath school class this morning is when you go to the church, in the pews of our church are two books. One is a Bible, the other is a church hymnal. What's the difference between the church hymnal and the Bible? The Bible is supposed to be read and the hymnal is supposed to be used when we're singing. And the way the words are laid out in the church hymnal is differently for the most part from the scriptures. Why? How does, how does the word get, words get laid out in the church hymnal? It's by verses, right? And there are some musical notes. We don't have musical notes here, but might as well get the lyrics. So when we say the law, the prophets, and the writings, God communicated to people in the Old Testament via the writings, via poems, via songs. God communicated directly to the people in the Old Testament to the writings of Moses, the Pentateuch, to, till today. Orthodox Jew has a very high regard for the law. In fact, one of our managers at work is a Jew. And, uh, you know, Yom Kippur is, you know, and uh, uh, Yom Kippur, the, the, the Day of Atonement, Pentecost, all the feasts are, are high days among the Jews. And he was talking and my friend was asking him, how, how do you go about celebrating this Jewish feast? Oh, there are 39 laws of the Sabbath. He said, you know, this was talking about the Jews. And most of the laws are, are derived from the Pentateuch. Okay? But aside from the, 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 the hymnist, aside from the psalmist, aside from Moses, the biggest, the biggest thing that, uh, that uh, God used, the biggest group that God used in order to, for him to communicate are the prophets. Uh, in fact, if you read in the New Testament, they said prophecy did not come by the will of man, but what? Holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What was the standard of the, uh, the New Testament? Whenever you wanted to evaluate whether something is of God or not, you base it on what the prophets wrote. Because the prophets is actually the word of God, you know, the, the nation of of Cleo, the, the companion book 
of the quarterly is entitled, Thus Set the Lord. A prophet is a thus set the Lord. The fact that the prophet speaks for God, he speaks God's word. And because it's God's word, it must be the absolute standard whereby you can judge and arbitrate any other issues that's, that's in there. So when we go to the New Testament, just an aside, uh, where are there prophets in the New Testament? Yes, there were. There's a gift of prophecy. But the gift of prophecy is different from the prophets in the Old Testament. The gift of prophecy is the ability to be able to speak the gospel and to be able to share. What is the standard in the New Testament? It's no longer the prophets. The standards in the New Testament is the, are the apostles, right? Because it's the way the apostles understood the prophets and interpreted what the prophetic writings were in the light of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as they wrote about Jesus Christ based on what the prophets have predicted about him, then they came up into a New Testament canon, becomes the standard of uh, the New Testament church in understanding what the gospel is all about. But you got to understand, the disciples and the apostles did not write from an empty reference. They had to base their writings from the prophets. In fact, when you listen to the Sermon of Peter, right, the Sermon of Paul, the Sermon of Stephen, who, who did they quote? They quote the Old Testament prophets. And that's what we're studying about. Now, it so happens there are two groups of prophets in the Old Testament. They're called major prophets and minor prophets. It's, not, it's nothing to do with chords, not major and minor chord. It's got nothing to do with the importance of their message because all of the messages of God are important. It's called minor because they are smaller. Okay? Um, how do I put it? There are two kinds of prophets. There are oral prophets and there are literary prophets. Let's go, just go back there. What are oral prophets? Oral prophets are those who spoke the word of God, such as Elijah and Elisha. Question, do you find any books written by Elijah or Elisha? No, but they were very powerful prophets in the Old Testament. So they are categorized as oral prophets. They were called by God just to speak for God. There are literary prophets. They're called literary prophets because they left a book named after themselves. That's why they are literary prophets. And those prophets are Isaiah, Isaiah Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are the four major prophets. About the minor prophets, which are smaller in length. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay, so you got 12 of those minor prophets and you got four of those major prophets. And to understand how all of this come into play, we will start going into the handouts that they gave you. Okay, everybody see this? Is this the kings of Israel? Yeah? Uh, let's start with the way we understood it earlier today. What are the basic empires that we know off the top of their head from the Old Testament? We always go back to Daniel, right? What's the first empire in Daniel? You got Babylon. What comes after Babylon? We got Medo, Persia, and then we have, I'm sorry, Greece. We have Greece, we have Rome, and then you got the divided kingdoms until the coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, if you go back to the history of the world, we just finished the study of creation. After creation came the fall, and after so many years, the flood came, right? There was a flood. And then after the flood, God chose a man. In fact, if you read the Huffington Post, Yesterday, there was a big discovery about Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was. Okay? A very big excavation to prove that Abraham was a real person. Okay? So, Abraham was called by God. And you know what happened, right? Abraham eventually uh, gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob. Jacob became, became Israel. And Israel gave birth to Joseph. Joseph became premier of Egypt. 
and then the entire children of Israel went to Egypt. What happened when the Pharaoh who knew Joseph died? They were taken into slavery. So we start with the holy history of the Jewish nation with what empire? We start with Egypt. And since they were slaves in Egypt, what happened then? God delivered them with a mighty hand and took them out of Egyptian slavery to take them to the promised land, which is the land of Canaan. Right? And eventually, Joshua took them over the borders. And when they got into Canaan's land and Joshua died, who took over the leadership of the Israelites? Joshua. Yeah, after Joshua. Okay, well, Caleb, and after Caleb and Joshua, they, they died. Who took over? Okay, the judges. That's right, Joshua, judges, okay? Judges took over. The judges were directly communicated to by God, and they ran the people of God. They were judges, right? So, and after so many years, yeah, including Samson, Deborah, you know, you, 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 Othniel, Gideon, all of those stories. We talk about, I'm pretty sure we will have one quarter about the judges. There, that, that's uh, a deep enough subject, so substantial, there's enough lessons there. But the point is, after the judges, the, the Israelites look up on about their surrounding nations, and they said, there's one difference between the nations and our nations. What did the Israelites say? They have kings, we don't have a king. Oh, not a bad judge. We want to be hip. We want to be like those guys. Give us a king. You know, there's a big, big debate about that. Finally, God conceded. Why do you need a king? I am your king, and I communicate through my judges. So they were given a king. So they, had, they started the monarchy. Who were the three first kings of Israel? Saul, David, and Solomon. Something happened after Solomon. Because Solomon was unfaithful to God towards the end of his life. There was a revolt and it divided the kingdom between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So that after the united monarchy, there was a divided monarchy. And what were the two kingdoms then? There was a kingdom of Israel up north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. Israel is normally referred to as the kingdom of Ephraim because Ephraim is the largest tribe in the northern, the ten tribes up north, and Judah is the larger of the tribe down south. Okay? So therefore, we got a divided monarchy. How did these monarchies run? The only way they can run was not just through the kings. Every time there was a king, there was a prophet that advised the king. Okay? I, I've said this, I told this in my class this morning in Sabbath school. Something has been borrowed by business corporations today okay, and incorporated in their mission statement. They, they quote from the Bible that says, without vision, the people perish. So we need vision. That's wrong. The real translation of that is, without the word of God, the people has no direction. Where does the word of God come from? It comes from the prophets. Without the prophetic word, there will be no direction. So every single, every single king had a prophet. And then let me jump and I'm going to go back. That's why the kings all the way, we had prophets from Babylon all the way to Middle Persia when Jerusalem was restored. Something went all right when Greece came into the picture. The cell phone rang. <laughs> okay. okay, so in Greece, this is what we call, let's call this, the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period is also known as the silent years. Why is it called the silent years? There was not a single prophet 400 years after Malachi into the messianic fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Those were the silent years. Those were the, as a period between the, the, the Old and the New Testament. That's the inter, intertestamental period. Why? Because there was no prophet, the word of God wasn't there. They became so steep with their laws. They, there was a lot of ceremonies. They institutionalized salvation. That's what happened there. Okay? So we basically stop here, there, but the, the minor prophets that we will be studying will, basi will basically be covering these nations. Okay, uh, there was a problem when 
Israel started having kings, especially Solomon. How many wives did Solomon have? Well, let's add a hundred there. Seven hundred, hundred wives, three hundred concubines. And those wives were not common wives. They were wives of royalty. If you marry royalty from another country and you bring the bride into your kingdom, what happens? Yeah, so aside from a united kingdom in terms of resources, culture of that other kingdom will come in. And culture is part, religion is part of that culture. Therefore, the heathen practices of the neighboring countries came into Israel. And of course, it becomes very, very attractive and the enemy will work and the people of God gets attracted to Baal and they get attracted to Ashtoreth and they started building all these shrines for the idols. And God said, no can do. You cannot be my people and serve other gods. You can only serve me. The only way you can serve me is if I discipline you. How do I discipline you? You know the story, right? If they obey, they succeed. If they disobey, God disciplines them and they go down, up and down, up and down. And you go into the cycle. Now in this particular case, what was the discipline administered by God? God used the neighboring countries to lay seeds on Israel, to capture Israel so that he, she will be disciplined. Okay. What was the kingdom before Babylon? After, what was the world empire before Babylon? If you know Daniel, we, okay. We always forget the 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah. Assyria was there before Nebuchadnezzar, the great general, took over and they started the Babylonian Empire. Okay, the fact that Assyria started, since it started here, they needed prophets to hold, help the kings get rid of idolatry and help the king run the nation. So in the handouts I gave you, you see Saul, David, and Solomon, and you see the division of the kingdoms. You see that? And in the middle of the division of the kingdoms are names. Do you see those names? These are the names of the prophets. Nadab, Elah, Zimri, Isaiah, those are, other, those are the kings that went in between. In fact, it was so bad according to the, the historical records. Uh, Hosea came into the picture shortly when Amos was finishing his prophetic ministry. And Hosea experienced at least six monarchs, six kings. Four out of the six kings that Hosea ministered to were assassinated. You know how they change kings? A king gets to be assassinated and then somebody else takes over. Okay? The fact that, the fact that somebody takes over in terms of, in terms of, uh, in terms of being a king, that, that shows you how violent they are. So, as you see all the kings in the left and right, there are... There are names in red. You see the names in red? What are those names in red? Those are prophets. That's why you see Elijah, Elisha. Who is the first minor prophet? See Jonah. Then you see Amos. You see Hosea, Micah, Isaiah. If you turn it over. Now you see Nahum. Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and possibly Joel at the back end. Okay, not the, 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 the 12 minor prophets are lined up in the Old Testament, not chronologically. This is a chronological feature of what's going on. I discussed this in our class this morning. What's so unique about Jonah? We will spend one Sabbath with Jonah. Who did Jonah minister to? Jonah ministered to... Nineveh, he was a reluctant prophet, but what kind of evangelistic effort did he have? A very successful one, the entire city of Nineveh. Where is Nineveh? What empire? Assyria, okay? Actually, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And the entire city of Nineveh was converted. They turned to God. So the question was, if, if, if Nineveh turned to God, how in the world is God categorizing them as a heathen nation? Answer is, the king during the time of Jonah died, right? And other Assyrian kings took over 
which went back to the heathen practices. And that's what happened there. Assyria then uh, became heathen and influenced the, the nation of Israel. But that's how you see this. And if you will notice, Hosea is what king? If you look at the, the first page, and I gave you this page 64 up on the upper right, left-hand side. Is during the time of Jeroboam, okay? And during the time of Isaiah, okay? There's another term you'd like to understand before we go into the study. This is what we call pre-exilic. And we got the post-exilic prophets. And of course, in the middle, we get the exilic prophets. What's the exilic prophet? Exilic talks about the exile. What exile are we talking about? Every time you study the Old Testament and you see in the commentaries and Bible study guides, post and pre-exilic, they are talking about the Babylonian exile. They were taken. Okay, by the way, what kingdom fell first? The northern or the southern kingdom? The kingdom of, north of Israel, the northern kingdom fell first. It fell to Assyria. Assyria took over. That's why we started having the Samaritans, the half-breeds. These, these were, they're, they're treated like dogs during the time of Jesus because they're like mestizos. They're half pagan and half people of God. And they, yeah, and that's why it, I, I, I've always said this. A, a lot of Mexicans don't like Puerto Ricans. You know why? They look the same, like Filipinos. Uh, because uh, Puerto Rico is not an independent state. It's a protectorate of the United States. I remember my friend, he said, what is the solution to the poverty in the Philippines? We still have Clark Air Force Base then. What we need to do is fly an airplane on top of Clark Air Force Base. We bomb one of the fields with nobody, okay? As soon as we bomb, America declares war against the Philippines and we lift up our hands and we surrender. <laughs> we become a U.S. protectorate. There goes the end of poverty in the Philippines. Okay, and they didn't like that. that to be a protectorate means to give up your national soul. Uh, that happened to the northern kingdom. The Assyrians started uh, in, in Samaria. All the Samaritans were hybrids of Jews and Assyrians. So they were the heathen and the people of God. It's very, very bad, bad news. Very bad situation. Okay, so when the northern kingdom fell, what kingdom was left? The kingdom of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. Did the, south, the, the southern kingdom or the, the kingdom of Judah eventually fall? Yes. Who took, who took the southern kingdom? Nebuchadnezzar took, you know, and there's a story of Daniel. Everybody knows this now, especially with your Adventist background. So they were taken into exile. Okay? Uh, look at the handouts I gave you. If I turn this around... Before the exile, you got Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, who were the pre-exilic prophets. Who were the prophets during the exile? There were two prophets. You got Daniel and Ezekiel. Daniel was in the king's court and Ezekiel was preaching right by the river in Babylon. Okay? And then after the exile, remember, because of prophecy, uh, King Artaxerxes signed a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Who were the prophets who ministered after the exile? You have the list there. You got Habakkuk, Obadiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and Joel. All of them are there. So you, now you know where the context is. So every time we open up a book in the Minor Prophets, you can place the prophet where it is, and you will know the context of, of what was going on among the people of God during the time. Okay? Now, another summary, which will probably be helpful. Okay, you see this? These are the list of the kings. If you take that with you, these are the list of the kings of Israel and Judah. Okay, this is, this is the chronological sequence of the list. And if you want to know the prophets, if you turn it over, there's also a list of all the prophets what kingdom they were ministering to, what was, what was the base, and what dates they ministered. That's why I told you, if you can hold on to this for the next 13 Sabbath, it will, it will help you understand the context of what you're studying. Okay. 
I wanted to distribute this to the class I had in Sabbath school this morning, but I meant this for the Sabbath school lesson preview. So <laughs> there's enough people. So there's enough people to, to get it. Okay, so hold on to that. If you can have a three hole puncher, put that in a folder of some sort and take that with you. It's easier to understand exactly what's going on. Okay? So we begin with guess what prophet? Of course, our author and our quarterly will begin with the sequence of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, who's the first minor prophet? Hosea. Okay? Actually, they could have started with Obadiah or Jonah. But they started with Hosea. Because Hosea is the first in the list of the Old Testament prophets. So we study Hosea. Where does Hosea come into play? Hosea come, comes into the kingdom of Assyria, he was ministering to the northern kingdom, not to the kingdom of Judah. Okay? He was ministering to the kings of the northern kingdom. What was going on among the children of Israel? They were heavily influenced by Assyrian culture because there was a heavy influence of Assyrian culture. What was going on with their religious practices? They had shrines to Baal, shrines to Ashtoreth, and uh, one pastor, like I was mentioning this morning in their class, who spared us the details of what kind of religious, moral, immoral practices they were doing in the temples of Baal and Ashtoreth. He can't even mention it. Just mentioning it, well, according to Chron the Chronicles and, and Kings, God said they were so debased in what they were doing, God was ready to vomit them out of the earth. You know, you think... Uh, well, we're slouching towards Sodom and Gomorrah, like what they wrote. You know, well, I told you this last, well, we didn't have it last week, but I think in the lesson study, we're now debating whether a man should marry a man in the Supreme Court of the United States. Well, the fact that we are even giving it the time of day for debate, it's telling us something is warped in our culture, right? Now, if you think that's bad, uh, man and man, woman and woman, I cannot go into the details of what Baal and Ashtoreth worship was. Um, why did they have temple prostitutes? You know why they have temple prostitutes? You go there, yeah, so that they, the priestesses can conceive and they offer, they, they, what's more called, they can have babies. What do they do to the, the babies in the temple? They offer them and pass them to the fire and burn them before the idols. How do you do that? They propagate it by the worshippers going to the prostitutes in the temple. This is an act, a religious practice. And then they burn the babies. You know, we don't burn them today in fire. We burn them in their wombs today with the pharmaceuticals and drugs. You know, but the, the similarity, I, did, I don't want to drag this in, but you think the culture there was the base. Push America some more. We, we'll probably be very close to what the Canaanite neighboring nations would be in what we're trying to do. Uh, it, what one thing is really, you know, they're debating it in Illinois, right? In Illinois alone, they're debating the, the, the DOMA and the marriage, the union between same-sex marriage. You know, the problem is if it becomes legalized, what happens to the pastors who wants to advocate the biblical principle of a marriage between a man and a woman? What happens when they preach against homosexual relationships? What will they be called? They will be called haters, right? Homophobic. They're haters of... Never mind. I don't want to go there anymore. But that's how bad it was. But laced it up several notches. You know, offering babies, committing immorality as part of the religious... Leader. What was that was going on? So, what did uh, Hosea do? He prophesied against Israel because of their idolatrous practice. Now, there are several ways a prophet can prophesy. A prophet can prophesy by speaking out, but a prophet can also, by God, can pro prophesy according to God, by God having an enacted parable. You know what an enacted parable is? Remember Ezekiel? He had to throw air in the, you know, hair in the air and chase this. And it's, the, the, these are enacted parables to, to explain something. Hosea did not proclaim. 
What kind of prophet was Hosea? He, he acted out a parable of a message to the people of God. What was that message? I know you guys studied it this morning. He was supposed to marry a... Well, another translation says he was supposed to, to marry a prostitute. And I said this in our class. If you want to really degrade somebody and speak evil of somebody, what is the favorite word that's used in our culture, whether it's Filipino or American? They will use another term for prostitute. And you're, in fact, it sounds, it sounds so debasing in the Filipino language. <laughs> you know, if you get the word for prostitute in the Filipino language, that's the way to curse. Really curse, really bad, using the word prostitute. Um, and the was, I guess the same was for English. So God tells Hosea, you marry a prostitute. Okay? So when everything started, Hosea said, cool, I want to be married. God giving me a wife. No, <laughs> it's just not just a wife. It's a special kind of wife. What kind of wife? Prostitute for a wife. Okay, let's go. You covered this already this morning. I, won't, I don't want to cover it. We'll, we'll go to the outline here. How many kids did uh, Gomer have? Three kids? Two sons, one daughter. Okay, the first was son. Second was a daughter. And the third was another son. According to commentators, we are not so sure whether the second and the third were the children of Hosea. They could have been children of some other man. Okay? Uh, let's finish the story. You got to understand. Um, there, there is no divorce in the Philippines, right? It's legal separation. But if you read the Bible, there's only one ground for divorce. What's the ground for divorce? Moral, immo moral indiscretion. Okay? So that's ground. <laughs> okay? Just one ground. Okay, the fact is, how many times did Gomer do it to Hosea? Many times. How many proofs? Three proofs. Okay, they had one kid. Okay, and then they had two other kids. These two other kids were probably not even the kids of Hosea. Well, what did God tell Hosea? If you go to Hosea 3, he said, love her. What happened to Gomer after she went wanton into prostitution? She became a slave. What happens when you become a slave? You get exposed in the market to be bought as merchandise. Benji was in our class this morning, but I will share this with you. Um, Ravi Zachariah is one of the uh, most visible apologies of the Christian faith today. He goes to Oxford, Princeton, Harvard to debate the best of the atheists. And Ravi has a daughter. She's, her name is Noemi. Noemi wanted to take after her dad until she found her calling. She went to Bangkok. And I think she went to Finland. And you know what she does today? She helps stop white slavery. You know what white slavery is about? Um, I mentioned this to our class this morning. Uh, I spoke at IS last year. After the sermon, I was on my way out to greet the people. There was a lady who gave me a picture. I didn't see her again. Turned out the picture was the picture of the, our high school graduating class, the officers of our high school graduating class. And... Uh, it was very precious. I, I had it scanned. I still have it. Uh, my, my friends in Facebook said that that was, uh, what, what, what was the term that they used? It was, it, was not, it was not unique. This is vintage. This is a very rare, very rare. This is a rare catch. Because uh, one of our officers in our high school class, we still cannot find till today. Uh, even now as we speak, they're doing the alumni in the Philippines, yeah, in AUP. 
they're having the largest reunion of our class in Tagaytay. And yet we tried to have several reunions already, but we couldn't find one of our classmates. She spent a whole lot of her life sending her sister to medical school and did everything she could to help support her sister. And we can't find her. According to some reports, she could have been a victim of white slavery. You know what white slavery is, right? They export females for the satisfaction of males. Very rampant in Bangkok. That's why there's a song of Chris Tomlin about saving the city. Because they went to Bangkok and saw this. And Noemi Zacharias in her testimony said, you know what really convinced her? She was walking down the streets of a country who was into white slavery. And you can see windows with bars. And behind the windows are women. And the tourists, the male tourists just walk. And with their visa or MasterCard, they pick what woman they want. And take it, take the woman with them like merchandise. How young are this? According to the reports, I've been hearing this this week, they can export as young as five, six years old of these girls. They develop them to be, uh, that's, that's how bad it is. Anyways, uh, that's one thing you can keep in prayer. That's one ministry you can support if you can think about that. But that's what happened to Gomer. Gomer went into prostitution and after she became a prostitute for a long time, she became a slave. You know, some guy said, hey, I don't make money out of you. So she gets, this, gets displayed in the marketplace. What did God tell Hosea in Hosea 3? You go and buy her back. And you know what the story says. I shared this with the class this morning. How much did Hosea pay? 15 pieces of silver and barley. Uh, and bushels. What, but now the question is, the typical price of a slave during the time of Hosea was 30 pieces of silver. That's why that was the price of Jesus when, when Judas betrayed Jesus. Why did Hosea just give 15 sil pieces of silver? Simple. That's all he could afford. He had 15 pieces of silver. And in order to make up for that, he had to give grain. What kind of grain is barley? It's the lowest, the cheapest kind of grain. It's not even wheat. It's barley. So what did Hosea basically do? He grabbed everything that he had so that he could buy Gomer back, who gave, her two, gave him two illegitimate child who was in prostitution for so many years. And how much did he pay to get her back? Probably emptied his pocket just to get Gomer back to him. Okay? And then when Hosea came, this is the last part of our lesson this morning, he said, you will not be owned by me. You will not go with another man. You will be a new woman. So I will be your constant companion. Anyways, what am I trying to say? God allowed Hosea to go through this process to teach a lesson. What was the message of Hosea? Despite the fact that the children of Israel is into spiritual adultery. You follow? They are unfaithful to me as their God. I will still go back and buy them with a very dear price so I can take them back to me. That's the message of Hosea. Okay? That's why uh, there are two lessons dedicated to Hosea in the entire quarter. The rest of the lessons is one per minor prophet. Only Hosea was afforded two lessons. The lesson this morning and the, ne the lesson next week. So you will find that somehow in Hosea you will see the love of God. And that there are four traits of the love, the traits of God in Hosea. Uh, this is the outline I'll suggest that you use. First is the love of God. Somebody read Hosea 11 verse 1. I should take this out so Tim can see this. Somebody read Hosea 11 verse 1.
Okay. How, how does God describe his relationship to Israel? Israel is a child. If Israel is a child, what is God? God, God is like a father. Um, I don't know about you. You guys have kids. And maybe your kids have behaved all their lives, okay? And more power to you if that has happened. But if your kid misbehaves, what do you do? You try to discipline them, right? Okay, sometimes your kid really upsets you because they become very belligerent and they don't even want to listen to you. Even if it comes to a point where your kid becomes belligerent and unwieldy, if something goes wrong with your kid, what will you do as a father? You will forget the belligerence, right? All I'm trying to say is regardless of how bad your kid has become, when your kid is in need, the heart of a father and a mother will melt and they go to the aid of the kid. Right? That's what he's trying to say. In the story of Hosea, regardless of how wayward his people can be, God still loves his people as a father loves a child. Verses 3 and 4. Elsa, you want to read that for us? I told Ephraim to walk, taking, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drove them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stopped and fed them. Okay, so you see the Father's love, and the same token, what did uh, Hosea say? I as God nurtured and blessed you and kept you. Okay, I nurtured you. I did not only love you as a father. I nurtured you. I helped you walk. I fed you. That's what I did to you. Okay, so we see a picture of God who is a nurturing God and a loving God in Hosea. Let's go to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. All right. Swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Okay, so the Lord brings a charge because the Lord is holy. He says, nobody knows my will anymore. Okay. Because God is holy, what is the primary exercise you need to engage in in order to recognize the holiness of God? Where do you find God? How do you get to know God? You read His Word. Nobody spends time with His Word. Therefore, they cannot understand what kind of a holy God they have. And the fact that you cannot understand God, you can go ahead and do your thing. You know, I, was, I was talking to a lot of friends during potluck today, during the, the ordinance of humility. I saw some of the kids standing in the sanctuary. I said, aren't you guys washing your feet? And one kid tells me, I did not cut my toenails. Why are they able to say that? Because they don't know about the word. If they understand the solemnity of the ordinance of humility and the Lord's Supper and they read the New Testament and they spend time understanding the word, they will not say that. What is the implication? If you do not know the word, you cannot be holy. You understand? That's why the Spirit said, God, Jesus said in his, his, his prayer, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Without the word of God, you cannot be sanctified. You will not find holiness. And that's what God is saying. Instead of you spending time with the scriptures, what do you do? You go to the temple prostitutes and do your thing with the heathen and paganistic gods that you have and the idols that you have. Chapter 7, 8, and 9. Ephraim makes himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake and turn. 
aliens have devoid of his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and they are on him, yet he does not know it. Okay, people who do not spend time reading God's word, God's word will not understand God's will. And if our kids do their thing without following God's will, what happened to their lives? It's going to go in ruins. And when it goes in ruins, what does Hosea say? They don't even know why it went in ruins. You know, that's why it's there, you know. God is saying, it's there. If you only read it, you, you could have had some guidance and you could have saved yourself a lot of grief if you only spend time with my word to, make it un to, to understand it, you know. Uh, and you know what? But what really kills me is if, while I'm looking at this, I, I remember one, I remember one parent come to me from church. Um, the daughter went her merry way. She did her own thing. She didn't care about church, didn't care about praying, didn't care about studying the Bible, did her own thing, pick her own guy. Came rushing to her mom one day and told her mom, Mom, I made a mess of my life. And we prayed, we we're praying for her, and somehow we see God working very slowly to bring her back. You will make a mess of your life if you do not follow God's word and follow His holiness. That's what God is trying to say here. Worse is you made a mess of your life and you don't understand because you haven't read it. You know, how how pitiful a lot of people you, you listen to testimonies that we hear today they mess up their life they don't know what's going on because they did not spend time understanding God's will and you know what happens who do they blame they blame God that's that's really pathetic when it comes to the point okay so Abby has the next part chapter 10 12 to 13 righteousness Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed, plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies, because you trusted in your own way, in the multitude of your mighty men. All right. What does it say? So, righteousness. And <laughs> like, I don't like the word so. Let's translate it. Plant righteousness, right? Put the seeds of righteousness. Have you experienced this in your life when you have been so good to somebody who you really didn't know? You just show some kindness and it paid off long term? Have you had that happen? Um, <laughs> you know that one story that uh, children's, uh, children, uh, children's favorite during bedtime is about this one guy who was walking to the jungle and he saw a lion, right? And the lion had the spike in one of uh, its foot. So they, uh, the kid helped take out that spike okay, and nurse that wound. And it turns out, according to the story, there was a persecution. And this Christian was taken into the Colosseum. And out of the other side of the Colosseum were the beasts. And the lion was let go. And the lion saw this Christian. And recognize the Christian. What did the lion do to him? The lion didn't devour him. He started licking him. Okay, it's like like a dog. What am I trying to do? Here's such a thing as paid forward. If you guys just do and saw righteousness, you know, even if you do not see the results right now, they're saying you will harvest righteousness and mercy if you start showing righteousness even now. Uh, so to say, that's why God is a God of, God is a God of holiness. And holiness is to know His will so that you will go into His tracks and not do something harmful. And then so you can sow kindness and righteousness to other people. Now we, we will go to justice. 9 verse 9. 9, nine verse 9. As in the days of Gibeah, he will remember their iniquity, he will punish their sins. Okay, let's translate in the New Testament. How does it go? Uh, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Okay, whatever you sow, do you reap? Do you understand that? 
If you sow tomatoes, what do you get? You don't get apples. You get tomatoes. If you sow oranges, you get oranges. You sow apples, you get apples. That's what he's saying. If you sow sin, what do you get? Because there's justice, God will not allow sin to be unpunished. He needs to punish the sin. Okay? In fact, in 1378, he said, those who remain in sin will be debarred. Wow! What a grim picture of God. You're saying, you're telling me. I'm looking at Hosea, and I have to see a grim picture of God. Is it true that God does not let sin go unpunished? Yes, he does. So what is our hope if all of us are sinners? The good news is that were our sins punished? Yes. Who was punished for our sins? Jesus was punished for our sins. And justice was actually demonstrated there. That's why it takes us to the last part where justice had to kiss mercy because in the justice of God, He still shows mercy. Let me read verse, chapter 14, verse 1. And just two more texts and then we will wrap this up. Oh, Israel, turn to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. All right, you just read verse 4 to Cleo. Verse 2. Mm -hmm. Take. Verse 4, I'm sorry. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. All right, so two things. Repent. After your repentance, what is God's promise? He will heal your backsliding. How does He heal? He only heals you when you repent. What's the meaning of repenting? What's the repentance? One of our managers, uh, one of yeah, one one of our ma managers at work is saying, "Hey, Bing, you know, do you know he's, 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 he lives in Instead. So a lot of the the young adults goes to his house and tells him to attend 180. There's a 180 service in Instead. You know what 180 stands for? Ben, you just mentioned it. 180 stands for 180 degrees. What is 180 degrees in geometry? You go to the opposite direction, right? 360 is full circle back. But 180 degrees is going, while you're going to this direction, 180 degrees is going to the other direction. It's a complete turn around. That's repentance. Repentance means, Lord, I messed up. Because I messed up, I don't want to do this anymore. Lord, I am repenting. I'm moving towards you now. I'm not moving away from you. And you know what the Lord says? If you do that and repent towards me, I promise I will gladly heal you. What has happened to you? Uh, I'm going to repeat what, what Adu always tells me. The reason why he, we talk so many times is there has been so many things that has happened to our church for the past several weeks. We had the memorial for Kevin. We got people in our church who are terminally ill, old and young alike. And if God is not talking, I don't know. When will God speak any louder to us? You know, and some people look at that and they say, Yeah, man, you cannot predict life. Maybe I should turn over my life to God now. Right? Which is good. Because they're beginning to understand what it means to repent. And they'll be gladly healed by God. But it's amazing that despite of what's going on and God talking to us, there are a lot of people who don't care what He says. Right? That's the mystery of unbelief. Because it's a mystery of unbelief. They will never understand. They will never find healing. But the good news is, a God of justice is also a God of mercy. And if you repent, you will be healed. Summarize it. God is a God of love. How is that love expressed? In His holiness, He wants you to know Him. And once you know Him, you will understand that He is a just God who will not let go of wickedness, who will punish it. But in His mercy, you will understand that He will get the punishment Himself. And then pay the price for you so that you can learn to repent. His goodness will lead you to repentance and you will be healed. That's one, uh, one illustration I haven't used for a long time and I'd like to end with that. Um, it's amazing that, uh, thank you. Matt Chandler was a, what's one of the, one of the young pastors that I really like today with uh, Francis Chan. A lot, there's a lot of young pastors now in the Christian world who has ministered to the youth. And Matt Chandler said while he was pursuing his degree, his seminary degree, he started attending church. And he saw this one lady sitting in church who was very dis distraught. 
And that uh, turned out when she, he introduced himself to the lady, the lady said, my husband just left me. It's, it's, it's broken. It was a very, very sad state where the lady was. So what is she doing? She's trying to, she try, she's trying to find fulfillment after her husband left her. And what does that mean? She's finding fulfillment outside marriage. You know what I'm trying to say. So one day, they saw each other again in the church. And while he invited the lady to church, the lady attended, and they sat with the lady with her friend. And the pastor was talking about fidelity. And had a show and tell, took a rose, okay? stripped the rose off its thorns, the very beautiful rose. And then you know what the pastor said? Let me demonstrate to you what fidelity and infidelity means. He throws the rose into the audience. One guy in the congregation caught the rose. And they started passing the rose from one person to the other. Eventually at the back end when every conceivable petal from the rose has already dropped off, they gave the rose back to the pastor and it's a wilted rose and the pastor said now who would want this rose that's the question of the pastor you can understand Matt Chandler inviting a lady a woman who has just been left by her husband is doing all these things needing comfort sitting there and the pastor telling them who would want this rose you are like this rose nobody wants you that's what he was trying to say Matt Chandler couldn't contain himself. He stood and said, you know what Matt Chandler said? Jesus wants that rose. That's a very powerful, powerful sermon. Uh, you want to hear the entirety? Go to YouTube. And you say, Jesus wants the rose. You say, Jesus wants the rose. Put Matt Chandler. You'll see the testimony of Matt Chandler. That's the way I look at Hosea. When somebody reads a story of Gomer, he said, who would like Gomer? Gomer is a wilted prostitute. You know, the, the worst that you can think of a woman, that's Gomer. Who would like Gomer? What's the message of Hosea? Christ would like Gomer and take her back. That's a very powerful story, powerful message. The message of Hosea is the amazing, redeeming love of God despite our unfaithfulness. After all, What will take you back? Yeah, I'll, I'll be driving this very close to home. So we had the memorial for Kevin. So our church experienced death from a very young member of our church. You think death can drive you back to Jesus? Probably can. Will it drive you back for the right reason? I would be scared and that would not be the right reason. The only way you can really be driven back to God in the right way is for you to realize how much God loves you and that not even death can separate you from his love and I think the author of our quarterly says there is no better parable to share with you to make you understand that kind of love than the enacted parable of Hosea and that is the message of the minor prophet Hosea you know what John MacArthur says a lot of commentators said that if you want to know, understand, understand love, you go to the New Testament. What book will you read in the New Testament to understand God's love? Tell me what book. John. Now, if you want to understand what love is, the love of God is in the Old Testament, what is the counterpart of John in the Old Testament? It is the book of Hosea. So you got God's love in Hosea and God's love in John. All two books pointing to the great sacrifice and the price that God paid in Jesus Christ that we may learn to repent and be saved in Him. Okay? So next week we will have another break because the choir will be in Morton Grove. But after that we will start talking about the rest of the minor prophets. I hope by the time we get to the end of the quarterly you will say, Oh, it was worth studying the minor prophets. Even if I haven't studied them for a long time, there is relevance even in the gospel in the minor prophets. Okay? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've spent in looking at this incredible story of the love between Jose and Gomer, a reflection of the love that you have 
for us. That regardless of our infidelity and our faithfulness, sometimes willful unfaithfulness and belligerence towards you, you still love us. Teach us to look at that love every day and melt our hearts that we might learn to turn from our wicked ways, repent and humble ourselves and follow your leanings. And in following your leanings, may we find healing that can come alone from that supreme love you've shown in your Son, Jesus Christ. Be with our Sabbath school classes this coming week as we share this tremendous story of your love. May that love draw each of the members of our class towards you once more and make them understand it's only the way to Jesus that can truly make things happen for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.